So let's talk about resume writing. First, we're going to cover what's included and what's not included. And then I'm going to walk through the three different formats and talk to you about why we recommend that you use the combination format for your resume. First of all, let's talk about why these two pages of real estate are so important. And I call them real estate because they really are two pieces of paper that are going to represent you out in the world. The first thing is your resume has to stand out from literally hundreds, if not thousands of other applicants. Typically today for a common job, let's say in downtown Toronto, they're going to receive literally hundreds of resumes. So you want to make sure that yours stands out. You have to remember as well that someone's only going to spend a few minutes reading it. So it can't be a novel. It has to be brief and concise, and they have to see a connection right away between the job that they're advertising and you. Again, this match is critical. I'm going to talk to you today about something called accomplishment statements. The match between you and the position are found in these accomplishment statements, as well as your cover letter. We're going to talk more about cover letter next week. It has to contain a lot of detail, yet be extremely clear, brief, and direct. This is hard to do, and that's why resume writing is a challenge. Don't ever confuse getting a job with having a great resume. What a great resume does, though, is it gets you an interview where you can sell yourself and get the job. I've had students say to me in the past, that they realized after they went through this type of resume writing information with me that they suddenly realized why it was they were never getting a call for an interview because they had many problems on their resume or they could understand why the employer wasn't seeing the match. So I hope you have your resume in front of you as we walk through the resume today. First of all, what's included and what's not included? This might seem like a pretty basic question, but actually this varies quite dramatically depending on where you come from. Different countries have different standards of what is included and what is not in included in a resume. So in Canada, what is included? Your current contact information. You may include a career objective statement. That's optional and I'm gonna walk you through that. You definitely include your education. You include a summary of your skills and experience and hint, hint, this is where the accomplishment statements comes in. You talk about your employment history in your resume, any accomplishments or special achievements like awards, if you receive like a team player type thing or any awards through high school or previous work experience. If you have volunteer history, employers love to see this. And you may include a references upon request statement. It's not required because it is assumed that you have references and will provide them. But if you have room at the bottom of your resume at the bottom of page two, you can include a statement that says references available upon request. It's not included. Well, there are a few things that we never ever include. We never include a photo with our resume. And again, that may seem obvious to those of us that have grown up here in Canada and maybe applied for different jobs. But if you were, for instance, to apply for a job in Australia, you must include a photo. So this definitely varies by country and it's important to know what is and is not included depending on where it is you're actually applying for a job. But here in Canada, no photo is required or necessary. We also never include our date of birth. We kind of leave it up to the recruiter to try and piece together how old we might be based on our education and experience. But we don't include our date of birth because we don't include anything where it could lead to someone discriminating against us. We do not include our social insurance number. That is our unique identifier with the Government of Canada and we don't give that out. We also do not include our age or our gender or our references. This is an important note. 
We do not send or give out our references unless it's specifically required with the application. Can you think for a second why it is that you think that we don't just send our references out right away? Well, if you think about it this way, you've asked three or four or five people to be your references and you've collected their personal information, their phone numbers and emails. You don't want to just send those out into the world as you're applying for multiple jobs. So we hold on to our references until we're asked for them, typically at a second interview. We're ready to dive in now. Let's talk about the three different types of resumes that are out there in the world today. There's something called the chronological, something called the functional, and as I mentioned at the beginning, the one that we recommend that you use is called the combination. It's the best of both worlds. But I want you to clearly understand why it is we point you in that direction as a new graduate. The chronological is organized by time. It lists your most recent education and experience first and then moves back historically to show all of your past experience. This type of resume works really well when you've stayed in the same industry or field for a long period of time. So for instance, if you started as a customer service representative within a company and then you moved up to a customer service supervisor, a customer service manager, maybe then a floor manager, but you worked all within the same industry. The chronological resume is really great because it shows that you've got lots of breadth and depth in what you've been doing. Even if you haven't stayed with the same company, but let's say you have, again, stayed in the same industry and moved up and around, this shows that you've worked in the same type of industry and you've had a similar type of job, perhaps progressing through your career over a long period of time. The second type of resume is something called a functional resume. And with this one, this resume is good if you are transitioning between careers because we organize this by experience or functions. And this really highlights any key traits that you have and gives employers, potential employers, an example of your experience. With this, you list relevant skills and information, and you put these together based on previous work experience. Your work experience is listed in a functional resume, but it's just a simple list with dates. The functional resumes are pretty complicated to put together, but they work really well, as I said, if you're changing careers. So let me give you an example. A friend of mine who I was working with said to me that she'd been off of work for three years, raising her family. She'd previously worked in insurance and she wanted to get into teaching. Well, she had lots of great work experience. She'd managed teams. She'd worked under tight deadlines and timelines. She had worked with other people for coaching and mentoring, but she didn't have any teaching experience. So we sat down and put together a functional resume. We didn't call out that she'd never been a teacher before. We basically grouped her skills together to show that she had all of the skills that a teacher would need and we basically minimized her work history or where she got those skills. So functional is one to keep in mind if you're ever transitioning careers in your future. Functional definitely highlights that you have lots of skills and experience that they may be looking for, but not in that particular area. So those are the first two. Hopefully you can understand the difference between these, the chronological and the functional. The one that we recommend is the combination because it's the best of both worlds. It's a blend of both chronological and functional. So it gives some details and dates about your previous employment, but it definitely puts together and highlights all of the great skills and experience you have. The best of both in that it allows you to highlight relevant skills relevant to the job that you're applying for and give you a bit more detail. These are challenging to put together because they are what's called accomplishment focused. You're going to hear a lot about accomplishment statements this semester. But this type of resume works the best with new graduates where you have lots of relevant skills, but not the exact work experience that you're applying for. So let's talk about how we lay out the combination style resume from the top to the bottom. So we're going to start at the very top of the page one of your resume. 
have your resume in front of you and be prepared to take some notes on it so you don't have to go back later. At the very top of page one is the heading section of your resume. You want to have your full name, your address, either your current or permanent, a phone number where you can be reached, home and mobile, or either, either, or, have a good email address, make sure it's professional, and your heading is going to be consistent on both page one and page two of your resume. This is important. If these two pieces of paper get separated, you want them to make sure that they know that both pieces belong to you. One more note too about the email address. They're not going to email you at coochiecoo123xxx to call you to ask you to come for an interview. So make sure your email address is very professional. Firstname.lastname at gmail.com is excellent. I would also discourage you from using your Durham College email. The only reason because for that is because it may take many months after you graduate for a company to reach out to you. And if you're no longer checking your Durham College email, you may lose out on a great opportunity. The next section is something called the objective statement. This is totally up to you whether you decide to include this or not. But it's basically one or maybe two sentences that's very clearly and concisely states the type of job you're seeking and you stay away from things like, I wish to gain experience. Because guess what? Everyone applying wishes to gain experience. You have to really focus, if you're going to use this, on what you can do for them. Make sure you look up keywords from the job posting and really turn this around as to what you're going to do, not what you want to do. Remember, you're applying for a job, so it's not what you want, it's what they're looking for. Keep that in mind if you're writing an objective statement. For my purposes, you can include an objective statement with your resume assignment, and I'll just give you feedback on it, whether I think it's good or bad, but it's totally up to you. You won't lose any marks if it's poorly written. I'll just give you some advice on what you should be doing with this statement. All right. Now we get to education. Here under the education section, which is right after the objective statement, you're going to list your most recent education first and then move backwards through time. Make sure you clearly list the degree, the diploma, or the certificate. So in your case, you're in the supply chain diploma or advanced diploma program. Do not use abbreviations. They're receiving hundreds of resumes and everyone uses different abbreviations. So they may be confused about what your qualifications are. Make sure you list the full name of the school, Durham College, the location, which would be Oshawa, and your expected year of graduation. Of course, you can include right underneath your designation courses that are relevant for the type of work you're applying for. Or if you're on the GPA with highest honors, you can also include that. So, for instance, if in the job posting they're saying that you have to have advanced Excel certification and knowledge of SAP, well, you've got that. So I would definitely include that you've taken those courses right underneath your education. Here's the other thing. You don't need to include high school if you have post-secondary. So you don't list high school on here. The reason for that is because it's assumed that you have high school in order to get to post-secondary. But there's one exception to this. Can you think of what it might be? If you graduated from a school where you spoke two languages, such as English and French, then I would, in that case, include high school. So if you graduated and you are bilingual, you should include high school with your date of graduation and make sure that they clearly see under a note underneath that you are bilingual in two official languages. Now we get to the third and the most important section of your resume. This is your relevant skills section, and you can call it relevant skills or relevant experience, however you want to term it. But this is where you look at the job posting. In the job posting that you're applying for, choose six to eight points where you know you've got proven experience. 
So for instance, if they're looking for communication skills, you're a great communicator. If they're looking for time management skills, you've got great time management skills. Basically what you wanna do is this is where they need to see the match between your resume and the job. If they don't see a match here, they're not gonna move on to page two. Think about both the soft skills that you have that they're looking for, like I said, communication, time management, organizational skills, but also hard skills, so computer skills, technical skills. Again, these have to be things where you feel that you've got proven expertise in these areas. So think about things that I'm really good at. Once you've highlighted these six to eight things, you're going to create six to eight bullet points in this section or a couple of categories with three or four points underneath them that are written as something called accomplishment statements. Your college course outline, the learning outcomes, gives you some ideas about the skills you're gaining here at college. And you're going to list these from most important or your strongest relevant skills to the least or your weakest relevant skills. These do not have to be job related experience. They can be college experience, volunteer experience, or any other experience that proves that you have the skill that is required. So don't be distraught if you don't have a lot of work experience and you're thinking, how am I gonna write these accomplishment statements? You're gonna see some in just a second and your resume booklet certainly helps you out with this, but you write these just to basically frame the experience that you have. You don't say where you got it. So these are critical. And let me show you one way of just thinking about these. So I've put this into a table just so I can sort of clearly break out for you how the accomplishment statement looks, but you would not do this in your own resume. First of all, you always start with an action verb. You then talk about what did you do? Make sure it's focused on what you did. And then the last piece of it is the positive result or the outcome of your action. That shows the proof and that's the important piece. So let's walk through the first one. Assisted customers with their questions and concerns and received the Employee of the Month Award for providing excellent service. Bam! That definitely shows me that you've got great customer service experience. So if that's something I'm looking for, I'm going to see that match immediately. Here's another one. Developed a marketing plan to raise funds for an annual charity event and increase donations by 35%. Wow. Now I know that you've got some proven marketing experience. Make sense? All right, here's one more. Created an organized database to track customer calls and improved efficiency when dealing with customer complaints. Nice. So this one doesn't quantify it by a percentage, it just says you helped improve efficiency. Wonderful. Again, this speaks to organizational skills, some computer skills. So I hope you're starting to get the idea. Action verb, description of what you did, positive result. It is a formula for creating these. And these can be hard to do, but you need six to eight of them. So craft them carefully. There's lots of help and suggestions in your resume booklet. Your resume booklet walks through all these different action verbs that you can use because you don't want to use the same one six times. You want to use different ones and use things like I achieved, sorry, don't use the word I, achieved, purchased, developed, trained, solved. So be creative and think about action verbs to describe what you did. Are you ready for page two? Well, page two, believe it or not, contains more accomplishment statements. Here's the thing, once we get to page two, now we get to your work experience. So we have the same heading that we had on page one, and now we start to look at your work experience. I say typically this is a really important area of your resume because if you've impressed them enough where they see the connection between you and the job, now they've moved on to page two. So you don't want to lose them now. You've got them, if you think about like fishing, you've got them on the hook. Page two needs to reel them in so they're going to call you for an interview. So don't be shy about your achievements and what you've accomplished in the past, regardless of the jobs that you've had. 
we say on page two that the rule of thumb is you go back approximately five to seven years maximum, but it depends on how relevant your older experience is to what you're applying for and how relevant those older skills are. So for instance, I've been in the workplace a long time and it pains me gratefully when I'm having to revise my resume and keep cutting and cutting and cutting out my older skills because I feel like they're still super important. But I realize that nobody cares that I know how to use DOS or nobody knows that I know how to use the, the first version of Microsoft Excel. So I have to just start to list the places I've worked with the dates and start to remove some of the bullet points underneath to keep it to two pages. So think about how far you want to go back. And if this is something that you've got concerns or questions with, as with all of these sections, please reach out to me and we can walk through yours because your resume is unique to you. And I'm happy to walk through any questions that you might have about your particular experience. When you're listing your work experience, you're going to list the job title, the company name, and the location, city and province, the dates of employment, so your time in years. If it's less than two years that you work somewhere, you also include the months. So for instance, if you work somewhere from September 2010 to August 2011, which is less than two years, you actually list the month and the year. Now here's the thing, underneath the work experience for each position, you list three to five accomplishment statements per job. Remember accomplishment, the verb, what did you do and what was the end result? Be careful of your verb tense here. You're either past tense if it was something you did in the past or your present tense if it's a current job that you're, that you're currently employed at. Again, to set yourself apart, you've got to think about accomplishments for each position. Think about the full scope of your responsibilities and what you did. Go beyond your job description and think about all of the areas of your employment and highlight your achievements. All right, here's another time for an example. Remember that friend I was telling you about that I was helping her with her resume? Well, under her work experience, she had the title of customer service supervisor. That's great. So under her work experience bullet point, she had supervised customer service representatives. And I said to her, this is terrible. Obviously, that's what you did because your title was customer service supervisor. We have to go beyond your job description. Tell me about the types of projects you were involved with, the types of things that you did, maybe some special things that you took on as well. And then she spent some time telling me more about her, about her time at her previous work experience. Here's what we came up with. Managed a customer service team and achieved a customer retention rate of 87% by implementing a focused customer loyalty program. Bam, I feel like that cook guy, but that's amazing. So she managed a customer service team achieved a high customer retention rate, and now here she had actual data around the 87%. But even if she didn't, she could have just said, achieved a high customer retention rate by implementing a focused customer loyalty program. That's a really well-written accomplishment statement. And it says a heck of a lot more than supervised customer service representatives. You with me? All right. Now we're at the bottom of the second page, and this is some optional sections, that something that you may have. If you have any of these things, you definitely want to include them. For instance, volunteer experience. So above and beyond any required volunteer experience that you may have completed through high school, if you've been involved in something like the Rotary Club or any other type of volunteer association, then you need to list it here. Employers love to see that you go above and beyond and it speaks to your character. Any professional development, so hint, hint, think LinkedIn learning. So if you're doing things on the side, completing additional courses that are gonna help you in your future profession, this is a great place to list them. Awards or achievements. Now, how far back do you go with this? Well, it depends. I mean, they don't wanna see that you got the Jiminy Cricket Award in grade three, but if you achieve some awards through sports, through the t your end of the time at high school, or even in the last 10 years, I would definitely include that. And hey, if you're a marathon runner, I would say that's an achievement too. 
So that may lay under the, item, the area of interests. People say, we used to call these hobbies, and people say, I don't feel like it's necessary to include these, but it depends on what the interests are. If you feel they're relevant and they speak to you as a person, consider putting them in. They like to learn more about you before they meet you. And if, for instance, you are a marathon runner, that says a lot about you, that you're determined, that you've got grit, that you stick to things. That's not something that everybody does. So you want to make sure that it, you can include some interests in here that set you apart. And again, if you need help writing these or crafting these, please reach out to me and we can talk a little bit more about the types of things that we can include in your optional section. All right, we're going to talk more on references soon, but again, as I mentioned at the start, you can include a statement that says references available upon request if you have the space. If you don't have room, you can leave this out because again, you're going to be expected to provide references when you go for the interview. Some final general resume guidelines I just want to walk through. One to two pages maximum. Your references are on a separate piece of paper. You want to make sure that things are aligned to the left of your on your page and your nice and bulleted phrases, brief and concise. This is not an essay. Begin your lines with action words and try not to repeat the same action verb over and over again. Remember that critical information is all on page one and like fishing, that's where you're setting the hook. You want to reel them in through page two. Remember to keep that consistent heading on both pages. You do not need to include any additional attachments as proof. You'll have your portfolio that we're going to walk through in a couple of weeks, and that's something you can always include. But make sure all the information on your resume is accurate, factual, and can be verified. They will check. Unlike perhaps part-time jobs or more casual employment, it's a very costly decision to hire the wrong person. So companies today do all of their due diligence to make sure that they fact check all of your information. So make sure everything on there can be verified. If not, you'll lose the job. The other things to remember, formatting must be absolutely consistent throughout. So what I mean by that is, if you're using a 12 point font for your heading and an 11 point font for your bullet points, make sure that's consistent all the way through. I'll give you one tip here. Print out your resume, the two pages. Put it on a piece of, on a table um, that's on paper and take about four steps back from that, that table. And immediately your eye will go to anything that's not lined up properly. So if dates aren't lined up, if some bullet points aren't lined up, it has to be absolutely consistent. It has to be perfect. Some other things, if you are handing in a paper copy of your resume, which some places still want a paper copy, your paper should be white or extremely light in color. Same with your references, your cover letter, and your resume. Gone are the days when you'd use a bright orange piece of paper, for instance, to get their attention. No, no. I want you to use a nice bright white. There's a company called Hammer Mill that sells this fantastic bright white paper. I guarantee you I don't have any shares in Hammer Mill, nor do I get a kickback for you buying their packages of paper. But if you go to Staples or one of those other places, you'll find that you can buy a package of Hammer Mill paper and it will do you for your entire career. Use that nice, heavier stock, bright white paper and it'll get you noticed. The other thing is find your font. What font do you like? What does the font say about you? Believe it or not, your font that you choose says quite a bit about you. So are you steady and easy as you go? That's nice in Times New Roman. Are you friendly? That's Tahoma, the friendly font. Your font says a lot about you. Again, this is like your business card, your calling card. So think about your font and make sure it's consistent throughout. And last but not least, you have to proofread meticulously. Make sure that there are no spelling, grammar, or formatting errors of any kind. And the more people that can read your resume, the more that this will help you out. So ask friends and family to proofread it for you to let you know if there's any type of spelling or grammar mistake. I hate to tell you this, but 
Sometimes up to one third of resumes when people apply for jobs get thrown in the garbage because there's a spelling or a grammatical or a formatting error. Companies expect you to put your best foot forward here. If your resume can't be perfect, they think that you'd just be sloppy at work and they won't even call you for an interview. So don't end up in the garbage file. Make sure it has been proofread and is perfect all the way through. It's your turn. Hopefully this has provided you with lots of information about your current resume. And as I said, I am here to help. So you're going to be submitting your resume assignment twice. It's worth 20% of your final mark, 10% each time. Well, you might be asking, what if I get perfect the first time? Then amazing, then you're done for the second time. The first time though you're gonna submit it, you're gonna get lots of feedback from me, and then you're gonna have an opportunity to correct any mistakes and resubmit it for the second 10%. It's literally a checklist that I use to grade your resume. So make sure you review the checklist for the resume cover letter and references thoroughly so that you know exactly what it is I'm looking for because I'm looking for what your future employer is looking for, perfection.